Hey everybody, welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. I'm your host, Chris Cosentino. We are here to talk about people that inspire and all my guests are inspiring in so many different ways. And I'm really looking forward to digging deep into how they got to where they are, to the top of their game, how hard they've worked, how much they've given up and how they're giving back. So without further ado, here's our next guest. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. Today, we are here with Chef James Scheibo. I have known James for, God, I'm afraid to say, because then that will date us. But we've had really great times together, whether it be traveling back from Aspen Food and Wine in a car trying to catch our flight (laughs) with seven people in a car that seats four and all our luggage, or just cooking great events uh, in the Bay Area for amazing charities. Um, But James, welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to, uh, to join me. Yeah, thank you for having me, Chris. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, you brought the Denver ride. I remember that. Yeah, that was also a lot of Aspen to catch a plane in Denver and <laughs> the rental car. Just like, oh man, that was that was fun. That was that really was fun. crazy. That was the year that you won uh, best new chef. Yeah, yeah. We all went out there, and our flight out of Aspen got canceled. Mm-hmm. So it was you, Tatiana, uh, Carissa Mondavi, yeah, uh, myself, and. Two other people I can't even remember. Yeah, packed into a four-person car with all of our luggage, <laughs> driving as fast as we can from Aspen to Denver to try to catch our flights home because it was Father's Day. That's right. We were trying to get home for Father's Day to spend it with our kids. So I will never forget that. That was one of the funnier. I mean, we were laughing, we were cursing, and then we all ran like crazy people to get to catch yeah. our. We ran into a people at security. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be one of the funnier ones right like your flight flew into oakland mine flew in, uh, my flight got canceled delayed yours was like on time and you made it home before i did uh, lucky. <laughs> Me. what a what a crazy trip that was yeah well i mean and that that was actually the year uh you won for comey right yeah comey opened 2009 um i received the award for 2010 a lot of things happened in 2009 we opened the restaurant in June 09, um, I got married three months later. Then we got the we got our first Michelin star in October, and then food and wine came knocking, and yeah, it just felt like it was a month ago. <laughs> Restaurant years flies, you know. It's yeah, 12 years ago. It's crazy. It's been I mean, you've been on a trajectory since then. I mean, you've really pushed you. Opening up Comey in Oakland for you was a really, really important thing to do. Um, you you grew up in Oakland. Your mom had a restaurant in Oakland. And I really think that that's, for me, I think that's such a cool wanting to stay at home. Like, I can't say that because I'm 3,000 miles from where I grew up. You know, I went as far away from home as I could. So having someone say that they want to stay where they grew up and really give back, I think is a really, really powerful thing. And I, and and I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, because I think people have a tendency to want to get away from where they're from, not stay where they're from. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I was a restaurant kid, you know, I grew up in restaurants, my mom and dad had a restaurant in Concord of all places. The first Thai restaurant, I was about eight years old at the time. So I spent all my summers um, at the restaurant. We, we We couldn't afford a babysitter. So I, you know, did some of my assignments from take home summer school and dry storage room, taking naps on rice bags. You know, that was my childhood right there. That's how I got into um, the love of cooking. You know, to me, you know, we always ate well. Um, Food was always like a celebratory meal for us uh, day in, day out with my parents being on the grind, being restaurant tours. Um, But yeah, even though we commuted to Concord, I just didn't feel like I belonged there. Just like, why are we opening the restaurant here in Concord? This feels so weird and awkward, and the landscape's different, and people look different, and the it's hot as shit. <laughs> it is hot out there, dude. Yeah, it's hot and dry. It's like, why are we doing this? But later on, um, my mom settled, um, opened a restaurant in Oakland when uh, an opportunity came up and soaked that place. So. Um, yeah, that's how I got into cooking um, through high school and whatnot and went to culinary school right shortly afterwards. And, you know, I was still curious about food. You know, I knew it was more than two mom and pop restaurants, you know, like 
looking at those old gourmet magazines. Remember those? <laughs> oh, God, those are great. Like I think, you know, the other day I just went, I went into my garage and I kid you not, I have every issue of Sauver from number one. And I was like, man, I didn't even realize I still had these. I was trying to clean out the garage to get rid of stuff. And I'm like, I can't get rid of those. Those, but you can still pick up those old magazines mm -hmm. to this day and look at them and they still give you awe, right? Oh. Yeah, for sure. Some of it's like very, very timeless. Even like the older art culinaires. Oh yeah. Like getting geeked out on uh, going to like a local newsstand just like after school, just spending a couple hours here, just flipping through those things. Like this, this kitchen does not look like my mom's kitchen. There aren't plastic stools everywhere. Everyone's standing around. <laughs> Everything's nice, shiny copper toques and white coats. It's like, you know, I kind of want to experience that type of caliber of cooking, you know, and. That's kind of sparked my interest into fine dining, actually, and and I was kind of a latchkey kid, um, so I needed that that discipline. But the military wasn't my thing. Maybe, maybe. It was too, maybe it was too authoritative. Like, and there's no creativity. Uh, this the cooking part was like, so I had to find a bridge between like creativity and discipline, and like in cooking and fine dining in the dining realm. That was I think that was like the perfect blend for me and you know, and um, being stimulated by food and what, what I do and be creative. And I just had to be in like a very more professional environment. Um, so I went to culinary school right after high school, um, got out of culinary school, worked a couple of jobs at some Pan-Asian places. Wasn't really feeling it. I was too familiar with the ingredients, you know, just like lemongrass. I've been seeing this shit all my life. I, you know, it's like, I remember going to culinary school. I made like brown butter for the first time. I was like, this shit blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's great. That's to me, that's awesome to hear that because it's yeah, I was the polar opposite, right? Like I had brown butter. Yeah. But like the Asian ingredients were like my head just popped. Like, what is this? Yeah, and like you know, turning butter from cream and stuff like that. And I I grew up on margarine, you know. <laughs> if anything, like mar margarine and sugar sandwiches, those those that's my jam still is actually. Um, but yeah, you know, like getting familiar with those ingredients that you know I see and read about in these magazines and whatnot and never ever had a chance to work in them uh, with it uh, aside like you know at home cooking for myself but you know you can only teach yourself so much um, so after culinary school so I did the whole pan-asian restaurant route thing just to get my foot through the door because I already familiar with ingredients a little bit of a comfort zone for me um, during that time, I was doing my stagiaire on my days off, uh, working at Masa's, and at the time, Ron Siegel was the chef. Wow. I was my days off there, just like being flying the wall, I helped out as I could, and I was like totally hooked, you know, and my next move was like, Ron at the time didn't have a position in the kitchen for me at all, um, you know, she was like, oh, no, like, I'll let you know when I have an opening, but I was very impatient, and um, well, time, let's talk like, about that right yeah. there just before I don't I hate to interrupt you but I think this yeah. is really important that was a time when positions were hard to come by oh yeah right think about that think about the juxtaposition now right like yeah. you had a chef you wanted to work for them you had to stage you got in there you staged maybe one or two days to see if you could work there mm -hmm. if they even had a position if they didn't you would volunteer just to see because yeah. you knew you couldn't get the position. So you had another job and you take your days off to work for somebody else for free, just for the knowledge. That doesn't happen anymore because there are positions everywhere. Everybody has openings. You can, yeah. it's like the, the world's your oyster as a cook right now. Jews, I know it's the times it's changed. It's like, man, like, I think I would, if I had the opportunity back when I was starting out, I'll be so far ahead of the game, <laughs> way far ahead of the game, you know? Um, but yeah, so like, long story short, um, I heard this gentleman named David Kinch was opening a restaurant called Manresa around 2002. That's when I was kind of itching to get out of this pan-Asian kitchen to do something more extravagant, um, be around unfamiliar ingredients, be around unfamiliar techniques. So I drove my way down to Los Gatos, um, a place I've never, I never, I never been past San Jose at this point in my life. <laughs> like going to Los Gatos, I was like, okay, where's this place? And, you know, it's like very little charming little like neighborhood. And I, I went in unannounced. I went through back through the delivery door. 
up the restaurant, knocked on the door, comes out um, Joseph Centeno of Orson Winston. He was a person wow. of cuisine there. Um, you know, and I was like, oh man, this guy looks scary, man. I was like, chef, can I just come hang out? Um, I just want to, I'm looking for a job. I'm, I'm willing to commute. I come from Oakland. I'm not planning to move down here at all. So long story short, I did a stage. I got, got the position. Um, you know, yeah. tell everybody how far you were driving to work because this is, that's serious. This, this is how I, yeah, right, going back to the place where like, like, you know, I never wanted to leave home this started very, very early. Like I didn't even want to move to like Hayward, <laughs> you know? I was like, I'm like, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay in Oakland. I'm gonna commute, you know, like about 40 miles each way every day, you know, hour drive to and from. And I actually enjoyed it. You know, at that time traffic wasn't so bad. I always left out during off commute hours, but you know, I was dedicated, you know, it's just like, this is gonna be worth the drive. This is gonna be worth the drive. And it was, definitely was. So I did that for five years, commuting <laughs> from Oakland to Los Gatos. That's one, that's a big drive, but let's talk about who was in that mix you were with. I mean, you were with what I look at now is powerhouses out there. You got, yeah. this is like, the, like, and I say that, and you know, some of them were laughing at me because one of them canceled on me yesterday. He couldn't do it because he got a root canal. And then um, the other one has been on already, but I think it's a really funny, funny conversation yeah. piece because that, that restaurant spawned brilliant talent. Yeah, for sure. So when we uh, when when race the first opened, it was open seven days a week. So I went in as kind of a tournant, um, which was like, you know, I was like in a way in over my head. I have never like cooked this type of food, whatever. So I just kind of sucked it up. So I was covering stations for other chef de parties and days off. Um, three weeks later, a gentleman named Jeremy Fox um, got the job as well. Uh, working Garmin J, so we would cover each other's stations, and yeah, like long story short, still my best friend, you know. Um, and then who else was there? John Paul Kimona, Kim Alter, Michael Gaines, Nico Delarocco's at Manresa, probably cross paths, but the list goes on and on. That was like that was like this. That was like a dojo. It was know? an iconic time when that restaurant was. Yeah, it was I mean. Dojo unbelievable talent, unbelievable education. I mean, David, you guys had a farm that, yeah. that you guys were pulling from, which directly, which was specifically growing for the restaurant. I mean, that was a different different time, I think, for, for the Bay Area. Yeah, you know, and, and, and walking through the place, um, men race, I remember going to the bathroom the very first time in the men's bathroom, had all these menus for when David dined out at, either apprentice at or dined out at, and he collected all these menus all framed. It was, Places from Arpege, Zubarora, like El Bouilly before the weight prefix. You know, it was like a la carte El Bouilly menu when like Spain wasn't even on the Euro yet, you know, and all these places like, wow, at this point, I didn't know what the hell Michelin was. It's just like tires. Okay, cool, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, like cooking there and like digging, getting more into it and seeing where his influence come from. It's like, you know what, it's like, you know, Europe was my next stop. I, I knew that, you know, it's like, I need to experience these places like firsthand. I mean, you can only get so much of it through books. And now I guess you have an advantage of Instagram and like geotags, but you know, that's still- right? Think about that. Like how much work it yeah. used to be to do that stuff, right? Like nowadays they just pop up Instagram, look at the pictures, look at stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, we used to have to collect menus like you're talking about, like David had it on the wall or you would oh, hear rumors okay. or food arts was the only information. Yeah, food arts, that's right. Food arts magazine. Yeah. You know, like that was it. You coveted that. If that showed up at the restaurant and you saw it, like you snagged it before everybody else did because you couldn't get it sent to your house. Only mm -hmm. could go to place of business. It opened the doors, right? Yeah. Just like made you aware of what's going on. Make, just make the culinary world a smaller place. But yeah. Even with Instagram, it's, I feel like it's still one dimensional. You know, you, you have to be there. You know, it's just, you can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't, you know, it's just pictures. And I think with Instagram, it's like people can look at it like, oh, I can cook that. It's like, no, you can't, dude. <laughs> let's, let's, let's not lie to yourself here. 
<laughs> but there's so many people who do. Like, think about when sous vide came out, right? Perfect example. Everybody's seeing all sous vide on Instagram. Everybody's like, I can do that. Yeah. And everybody's giving like their parents dysentery or like some god awful food poisoning from improperly cooking food sous vide yeah. because they're re- trying to read between the lines on a picture. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's just not how things work. You know, it's funny because. I was popping through a bunch of books the other day and I busted out, I can't remember which one it is, which, uh, where's the big monsters? Uh, I think it's family meal that you're in. The one, uh, the El Bui one? El Bui one. Yeah, yeah. So like, I'm, I was like, hey, that's James. Like, <laughs> I, had, I had hair then. You had hair then? <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there, was a, there was a bet between my roommate and I. My roommate at El Bui, uh, which I met, uh, American, it was Anthony Secriar, he's the chef owner of Protégé. So I met him there. So, so yeah, long story short, so going back, like, you know, race inspired me to go to Europe. So in 2005, I was like, hey, hey chef, I'm a, uh, my last day will be New Year's Eve 2004. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, 2008. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go away. I was like, I wanna, I wanna go to Europe. I wanna do what you did as a young cook and traveled and work for free and you know burn a hole in my credit card and all these extravagant meals for me that was grad school that's the way i looked at it you know i went to culinary school that was undergrad you know 18 months whatever um it's like i need to go i need to go away to like firsthand travel be in my own for once not like live in mom's house you know it can be very very independent so i what i did was i uh, signed up as an sta student at cal berkeley so you got all these discounts and whatnot. And I traveled there without a visa. Uh, I have stages lined up a fat dog, Mugaritz. So one month became three months, three months became six months, six months became a year. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, just like one, like once I got there, like more and more door, doors open. It's like, oh, where do you want to go next? Like, uh, driving down to the Basque country. I think I'm gonna spend some time in Mugaritz. So I'm like, did my time there. It's like, where now? It's like, uh, it's kind of cold here in the Basque country. I need to go. I need to go to the beach. I'm going to Barcelona. <laughs> I took a bus to Barcelona. Um, we're going to place our alchemia um, right there in the near the Gaudi uh, Cathedral there. And then, you know, it's just more and more doors open. Like, oh, where do you want to do now? It's like, oh, I'm gonna, I've never been to Paris. Like, how far is Paris? Um, took the train up to Paris, just kind of goofed off, ate out a lot, went to museums. Um, at the time, Pim was there. So Pim was my tour guide. Uh, oh some wow! Awesome meals there. Timing was everything, and then um, crazy enough, I applied for a stage at uh, for a season El Bui, um a year before, and never heard anything. It's like dead silence, you know. I told them who I was, where I was working, and then race. I was a sous chef at the time. We were in the fifty best, whatnot. I didn't hear anything, and then I was ready to come home. I was like, okay, here's Paris. I don't know. I'm kind of broke right now. Burn my whole like Pierre Garnier took all my fucking money. <laughs> uh, so I'm ready to come home and then book my flight to STA office to come home. And then uh, the day before my flight, I got an email from Alba Rahri, the, sh- the chef de cuisine at El Bouyi. He's like, hey, this guy quit on us and we have room for you here at El Bouyi. Can you be here tomorrow? I'm like, how does he know I'm in Europe? Like, it's yeah, just like timing was like, crazy so I was on the fence of coming home or like going back to Spain and I made a phone call I talked to Jeremy talked to Ken she's like hey what should I do I'm they're like go 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 so I went back <laughs> did a full season in LVE. um that's where I met Tony and then like traveled to more I went to Italy and then went back to UK and then finally came back home yeah and, uh, that was like my European tour like yeah you know, like I said two months became 12 months and yeah at that time it was easier to do i don't know how i got away with like no visas and whatnot and no one ever asked can you imagine now now it's like a whole other world yeah yeah you know it's well i felt safe and i was walking around with a backpack full of knives so <laughs> well it's funny because i actually had a cook that uh came to me at in Encan- back in the encanto days because he was supposed to stage uh in where was he supposed to go? In the UK. And he had his knives and they only had a one-way ticket. 
Mm. He caught him and they, they impounded him in the London airport. Oh, yeah. In Heathrow. And then he turned around and sent him home. He ended up showing back up. Yeah, I heard that. I heard a couple of stories about that, like that happened to people. I remember the fat doctor were telling me, like, like don't say you're working. Don't say you're working. I was like, just say you're a student backpacking, which I was. I was gave my STA card. Like, look, I just, here's my student discount card to museums and train stations, bus ride. I'm just packing through. I'm leaving the hostels. I got a knife because I want to cook for myself. I can't afford to eat out every day. And I'm like, okay, pass. So that's amazing. That's the bullet in that one. <laughs> You sure did. <laughs> you <laughs> That's amazing. But I think, I mean, that opened your eyes, right? So you went from, like you said, you know, growing up, eating yeah. traditional, you know, mm -hmm. Asian ingredients, and then you, you go to school, and then you go to Europe, and you're working with David. Where did you go when you came back? Like, what was that next moment for you? It's like, do I start out on my own? Do I go back? Well, when I came back... Actually, I traveled in 2005. So when I came back, uh, I had no plans. Um, I could have gone back to Manresa, but I was like, oh, you know, I just want to do something different. And he, um, David was telling me uh, Daniel Patterson's opening a restaurant in the city. I was like, sweet. I want to kind of, you know, obviously I want to open my own restaurant because I've always been the eye on the prize. And he knew that. And it's like, how far, how far along is he? He's like, are we cooking yet? It's like, no, he's still in construction phase. It's like, do you need help with construction? And letting you know, I was flagstoning the entry of the restaurant. I was penny tiling the bathrooms, laying down carpet, hanging light fixtures, uh, kind of doing it all. You know, it's like kind of like really, really mentally and preparing myself to open my own place and seeing the construction side of things, working with contractors and seeing how that, and you know, getting to the fact that you just like restaurant openings going to be delayed. <laughs> that is for sure. And over budget. <laughs> So, <laughs> so that was like kind of my first taste, but like it was very hands-on experience, you know, from, from, from day one. So that was like a really good time for me to kind of like really absorb that all. It's like the stuff they don't teach you in culinary school, you know, as like uh, being a like pretty much grassroots, ground up chef, like restaurant owner. I don't like to use the word restaurateur, it's weird. But <laughs> well, there's uh, more to the. I think there's more to it that that the school is. I I definitely think that school could give us more. Yes, they do the management and all those things, but like, how about refrigeration repair, plumbing, yeah, basic electrical, all these things that we spend a fortune on now every day. Mm -hmm. If they taught you some of those things at school, can you imagine how much more profitable a restaurant could be, or how much more less stress it would be involved with every day? Oh, exactly. Exactly. I do that stuff now. It could me like, like oh, I can't like this pilot. It's like, oh, okay, let me change out the thermocouple because I know if I cost them, it's going to cost me $275 to replace a, like a $20 part. Yeah. You know, that I can do myself. So it's for sure. Those are things that I think are really, really important. I keep telling schools that, that they need to give basic training in these things, but they, I think they look at us like we're crazy because yeah. they're not living that life you know so they should make it like a, like a technical course like like wood shop exactly you know pilots you know thermal couples how to clean out your salamander properly how to de-dust you know like all those things buildings mm -hmm. like how to read plans how to you know manage yeah. all that stuff's real real deal yeah super valuable it's something you can take along with you the whole time and I, I remember um, something I always stick with me. I also still tell my chefs now. It's like um, David, you know, when he opened Marisa, it was a big project. So it's like, hey, it's like, he's like, I always remember this. It's like cooking is the easy part. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, if I just come in, just cook, man, my life would be so easy, you know, and fun and enjoyable. I mean, it's enjoyable now, but, you know, it's like less distractions. Like, yeah. And it, I think it's also, less stress oh yeah you don't realize that you you always have this younger generation that is thriving and striving they they want your job right i want to be the sous chef i want to move up i want to move up it's like do you realize you cook less and you do more paperwork and you do more maintenance and you do like i think they don't realize that there's more to it than just working on menus and cooking and being creative yeah, I mean, it's rare right now like if i can pick up a knife for like an hour straight i'm happy yeah you know I'm, I'm happy but like like even i do that it's, it's hard to have an undivided attention when i'm cooking because there's because i'm because i'm cooking i'm putting some admin stuff aside on the back burner 
for it to pile it up for me to get to at like 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I mean. Yeah. Here's all my yeah, that's costume spreadsheet. sheets. Spreadsheets, yeah, I know. Spreadsheets are a massive part of your life at that point. So sorry, so I digressed. You were yeah, you, so all you good. So out. yeah, so we opened Qua, got Daniel open, but not, and then um, you know, I was still cooking Daniel's food. I love Daniel's food, learning a lot of techniques from him, you know, using like fragrances and food and like that. It was a very, very different approach. For me, it's like not just learning about techniques, but really absorbing like different philosophies of cooking. Um, LBE was great um, in a way, the sense to where like they always ask the question like, why not? You know, you know, we always ask Ferran's like, why are we making warm ice creams? Kind of an oxymoron. He goes, why not? <laughs> yeah, warm ice cream. That's amazing. Yeah, it's just like it sounds like the, the the term just sounds like oxymoron. And his, his excuse is just, why not? Why not? Why not? So, you know, it gives you it's definitely a sense of freedom to actually even just to try, not just to shoot down an idea. Um, so, yeah. So after that, you know, I, I wanted to like hone my own style of cooking. I just felt like I've been kind of harvesting everyone else's philosophies, not coming up with my own style or my own personality show. And I needed like, more like be and take an exec chef job. That was my next challenge. Um, to work, to see like the financial side of things and how to run a business. So I took the chef job at Plum Jack Cafe. I remember that. I ate there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was an awesome time. So I, I got a carte blanche on that place. Uh, they really want to re do refined cooking there, which we did, you know. Um, yeah, it was a rough 10 months. We were open seven days a week, five lunches, seven dinners. I worked 10 months straight like no days off um because the brigade was kept set up differently there you know we had lunch crew and dinner crew it's like a lunch crew can't prep for dinner because they're doing lunch so so my sous chef and i we prepped a whole dinner menu just the two of us and my cooks walk in at three o'clock so um wow that's, that's how it was we did it you know it was it was fun it was a learning learning experience the place was busy gangbusters it was profitable um, even like the uh, the CFO was like, oh my God, we're making money. I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, you guys been making money before? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I saw like, you know, p and L. The first time I seen a p and L was at that time, going through all the line items, like really, really controlling labor. In some ways, like being in like corp corporate environment um, kind of helped you organize that in your mind. So that was my very first, very corporate-ish job. Um, really, every, everything else has kind of been like, you know, you know small business owner um, type of establishments. But yeah, that was a really eye-opening experience. Made me realize like, you know, there can be a blend of the two for sure. And I think uh, right now that's really, that's what's gonna succeed. I mean, yes, mom and pop. I love the concept of having an independent owned restaurant, but there is the benefits of being within a corporate environment, learning those techniques and then drifting them over into an independent because it allows you to really look at the minutia and the detail of everything that's going on. Yeah, you know, you also look at things in like in the bigger grand scale of things. It's like, you know, yes, you know, it's five bucks a day by five bucks times a year. That's a lot, you know, that could have been, that's a new, that's a new RoboCoop we can get every year. You know, you got to think about it like that way, right? <laughs> you know, like as a cook, you don't think about that. It's like, oh, five bucks a day. Like I just spend that on coffee, whatever, you know, and that's 1500 bucks a year. That's, yeah, like I said, that's a brand new water circulator we could have. And I think that's a really, really relevant part that people don't bring up. They don't think about that. They don't think about all the little details, like pennies add up and it's, you think about those old school French chefs, right? That you, you would hear and like I had them where they would dump out your little, your bin on your station and like sort through and like see what you're throwing away. Yeah, You're not trimming your, your vegetables right or you're over peeling or yeah. they're looking at dollars and cents. And I don't think there's a lot of that nowadays. Yeah, you know, especially like a lot of people don't know what, how much ingredients cost. Even as cooks sometimes, you know, cause it's just, I, I need to order like, you know, six bunches of chives and blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know how much a bunch of chives costs? Tarragon, Tarragon is a big one, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah. And like you know, food waste in general, not for a cost perspective, but also like being respectful to the ingredients and the farmers and, you know, having that farm maybe realize and then raise of like, man, there's a lot of effort that goes into growing vegetables and herbs and lots of care just uh, for us just to like, you know, pick half of it and throw in the stems in the trash. It's like, we don't actually don't do them any justice. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's just, um, yeah, it's just kind of blindsided in one spot. It's like almost like a blind spot that most, um, as a young cook, I didn't see until we had our own farm and we spend a day there and see what they do just to keep it going and like changing, turning the soil for the season, man, that was work, you know. Oh, yeah. The, the crops and whatnot. So, yeah, it definitely made me more, uh, more responsible cook. Uh, for sure. I mean, you can even think about it and take it even to the next step. It's like taking taking a cook to an animal harvest mm -hmm. teaches them to never burn an animal, to never burn a piece of meat. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like that's that's a big, you know, picking strawberries, being down on your hands and knees and bending over and picking strawberries and filling a flat of strawberries. Like, make a cook do that, and then see how much product they waste. They're, you know, imagine having to do that all day. Yeah. Right, that that goes. That's really that's the sink in. I think that's really missed a lot. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so I took the chef for Plum Jack, two thousand eight, um, and then um, at the time, Jeremy Fox was still the, he he moved up as chef de cuisine at Menresa because I went to Europe, um, and Jeremy was leaving to open Ubuntu at that time. And David came to call me to ask me to come back to take his place at the CBC. And I was like, absolutely. He's like, can I be there tomorrow? <laughs> 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 so yeah, so I took the job in race. At this time, I'm still living in Oakland. I was like, yeah, I'm going to commute, whatever. You know, and, you know, even when I started men race until this, my second tour, I was like, hey, I'm still going to open that restaurant in Oakland, man. I'm still going to open that restaurant in Oakland. And uh, he knew I was like, I mean, like we didn't have a close relationship so you know I was like shopping for a space while I was at CBC there and just like keep my eye on the market granted this was like 2008 2007 2008 when the economy was shit so you know a lot of spaces were coming up I didn't know what was going on you know and I asked for advice like first time I had to deal with a lawyer you know so oh, we, that's we, a nightmare isn't it to read the leases and stuff like that and start my own LLC and whatnot, raise some money. And yeah, by the end of 2008, um, I signed a lease and when construction first day, me and my friend with some, with some crowbars some sledgehammer, did some demo. That was a lot, that was a lot of fun, actually. Check <laughs> <laughs> out on things. It was amazing. Take out your frustration on an old wall. On an old wall, yeah. It's like, oh, it's not load bearing, right? Sweet. I was like, I wish you could drop my truck through it. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the area that you chose, talk about a little bit about that. I mean, you're, where yeah. you are in, in Oakland and, and what made you decide on what area to be in? Because I think as young cooks that want to move forward and grow and open their own business, like how did you make that decision of what neighborhood to be in in Oakland? Like what, what was the deciding factors for you? Yeah, you know, the, the crazy thing is like I was, when I was looking for a space, I was looking to either do a build out or take over an existing restaurant. But at that time, like, raising capital and getting a uh, SBA loans nearly impossible because of where the economy was, especially for a restaurant. Um, I was just looking to a local ad and found out um, the space where we're at now on Piedmont Avenue is an older commercial neighborhood so next door to Beowulf, um, which is like a pretty landmarkish restaurant there. Um, it was 15, 1300 square feet and had an open kitchen. And this time I was like, I was so desperate to open my own place. It's like, I'll take it. <laughs> Given to those, like I've never worked in an open kitchen before. You know, this is like my first open kitchen experience. They had a <laughs> kitchen counter, like a sushi <laughs> counter. And in a fine dining envir environment, um, you know, good thing I'm not a screamer or a yeller. You know, I, just, I, I do give people the dust there, but. <laughs> you, you, have, you have the perfect, uh, it's the look, I like to call it. You have the look, like, are you serious? You really think you're going to do that? And then like, you can see the cooks around and they go, uh, okay. They, you just don't even, <laughs> it's awesome. You don't even have to say anything. I love that. 
Yeah, so we um yeah we did, we did the demo, I tiled the floors, like all the things, Jack, all the things I learned, opening qua, I applied, you know, painted the ceiling. I mean, I, there was nights where I, I spent the night there actually, you know, cause I had to get up early. It was like, we're paying rent at this time. We had any free rent. So we were like chasing the clock. Um, and then uh, yeah, six months later, we opened the restaurant with a thousand dollars in the bank <laughs> for our operating capital. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's- that's uh, that's not easy. That's not an easy task to open with a thousand dollars in the bank. I mean, that's oh, like, no, the credit cards and yeah, credit card debt. Like crazy thing is, like I didn't raise much money. I mean, it was like my friends. They're like, oh, here's ten thousand dollars. Like, hey, you know, if I lose your money, we're still cool, right? Because you know, I might lose it. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I don't expect anything back. I was like, I just want you to do your thing. Those are the best. Those are the best like investor relationships. <laughs> There's not many of those. Let's just <laughs> let's just clarify that out there. They want their money back, most folks. Yeah, uh, it's few and far between. Where they're like, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. But so, really, restaurants are the worst thing to invest in. I'll say it. Oh yeah, I, I was so I opened a restaurant like mostly in credit cards. I was really good at doing balance transfers. I like I had like a spreadsheet and like when to balance when to transfer balances from one card to another. Low interest rates where I was like moving money around like it was like crazy. To keep the restaurant going did my own bookkeeping for like the first six months which was like a wreck probably hired an accountant and cleaned up on my mess i was like you know what i'm a chef it's good it was a good thing i did it though like i like to see all the invoices and you know, being hands-on at that point like it was like the crucial times like okay we either make it or break it in six months <laughs> and, and let's put this in a, in, in a bigger picture like you're cooking mm-hmm. you're in front of the guest every night. Yeah. And on top of that, you're managing the books. Yeah. You're answering the phones. So you're, you're doing it all. Yeah. I was expoing, working Garmin J at the same time. Um, we started with three in the kitchen, a pastry chef, a sous chef, a chef de partie, and myself. We're all working stations. We had two saute pan, two pans, for like one rondo. We didn't even have a sign. And because we couldn't afford one, there was no art in the walls because we couldn't afford it. And it was also by choice, but the no sign thing, people were like, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. People thought that I was pretentious because I didn't have a sign, you know? I was like, even though the sign bracket was still there, we were like, oh, I was like, oh, you guys are so, you guys are too cool, huh? Who you guys think you are? Uh, you guys think you're hostile? You guys don't realize you need a sign for your customers to come in? I was like, no, I just can't afford one. I want to make payroll. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I have staff here that I want to take care of. I can't. Yeah, like, I mean, sign. like, do you want to give me a sign? You want to make yeah, me? Exactly. It'd like, be nice to have like six extra sheet trays, sheet pans right now, you know? So it's amazing perception versus reality, right? Like what yeah. people think may be what's going on, but the actuality of it is, is like times are tough. Yeah, you gotta, just got to make do. You got to make things work. And it's like, you did make things work and you have continued to push that envelope forward that, you know, you've done, you have Comey now and you, you were just awarded what, what, ha- what just happened? What just happened? I don't know. I don't know. You got stars. I'm, if I'm, Oh yeah. We get two mission stars. So it's come on. That's, that's a really, yeah, big... it's a big, it's a big homecoming for me because uh, we're the only stars in Oakland and the East Bay. So I've been there since 2009. So it's been a, uh... Been, it's been it's been good i feel like i'm holding it down for the town per se i mean the meals i've had there have been incredible we had our anniversary dinner one, one night uh, one night there which was mind-blowing and fun and the room feels great you you make the just the feeling when you walk in is so amazing and i think that you've set an example of what can be done and i don't want to say diy but you did do it on your own terms in every step of the way. You have never followed anybody else's path. You've never chosen the easy way. You chose the James Shiba way, which is the hard way. I think that's why you well, it is the hard way. It's the hardest way, but it's also the most rewarding way. And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But now, like now, like, you know, as, as the restaurant got bigger now, we started with like what's eight employees. Now we're up to like 22 now with the bar side um now it's like you know it's it's hard because i've been doing a lot 
on my own myself, it's been hard to let go and delegate, to be honest. You know, it's a hard I'm, thing to step back to know it's time to like, okay, yeah. time to pass some of this on and transfer yeah. this this workload to this individual so I can focus on different things. And and you're not the only person that's I struggle with that all the time. I'm I'm like the worst. Like uh, you become I would say super micromanager and over, over, and you drive the staff crazy by it. I mean, not saying that you do, but like, that's what ends up happening when, cause we, we have a difficulty stepping back. Yeah. Oh, well, so, so I'm just also very particular on very like the smaller devils in the details, right? Like they don't see what you see, but like, and you know, my wife reminds me all the time, just like, well, how come so-and-so don't see it this way? It's like, you see it that way because it's your restaurant and you're the boss and it's your idea and unless they can read your mind they won't be able to see it i'm like good point <laughs> yeah, i mean that's a tough part i think about about our industry and trans transferring that knowledge and that creativity to the next group that's running what you're doing but also having them feel live and breathe the property just like you do it's, it's a very hard thing no, it's a very hard thing, but it's, it's 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 promising. Right now, I have a really, really really solid staff. I think the most solid, like front and back, um, since we opened. Everyone's super passionate. Everyone's a good team player. People are still want to cook fine dining food. You know, that's really good for me to see. There's there's one. I have a couple cooks for two cooks right now. They're like, you know, you that's you remind me of me when I was 22. That's awesome. Very very curious doesn't complain, put his heads, put their heads down, always asking the right questions, always asking questions in general. I was like, you're not bugging me. If you're asking me a question because one, you don't know and you, because you care to know, you know, like don't, don't be afraid to come ask questions or, you know, double check or triple check with me if something's not right or you feel it's not right. You know, I, I don't want to, really I don't want to know at 6 p.m. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How many times has that happened in our life? I think that's a really great point. I think there's definitely the fear to, there's a lot of folks out there that have the fear to ask questions. And I like to say, you know, never assume because it makes an ass out of you and me. That's a really, really right. Yeah. True thought process. Because if you don't follow through, if you don't really ask the questions, one, you're not going to retain the knowledge. And two, as a, as a young cook, you can take those notes and really, really benefit from them in, in the long haul. Yeah. You know, it's just like, Hey, you're here to learn, right? Like ask questions. I'm sure you have every notebook, right? Do you have all your notebooks from everywhere? That moleskins, yeah. 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 I, I've been slowly transcribing now to like Google Docs and stuff like that. I'm trying to do anything more electronic, trying to, you know, sharing all my recipes on a Google Drive now and things like that. Because, you know, moleskins get dirty, lost, or whatever. And, you know, I don't want to carry five moleskins with me. I can just have my phone with, a, with an app these days. Like, yeah. you know, kind of beautiful that way. You know, isn't it amazing though? Like the difference between the way that we used to take in all that knowledge, like draw pictures, mm -hmm. write everything out in detail, plate descriptions. Now it's like the kid, boop, take a picture, they're done. I'm like, yep, exactly. Chef, can I get this recipe for this? I was like, yeah, I'll text it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, I don't have time to write it down right now. I was like, don't worry, I'll text it to you. It's in the Google Drive. Just check the check the folder. You know. See, that's great. Right. But that's that I think is it's evolution of what we of what we w once were and now what we are becoming. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing to recognize that evolution is inevitable and we're going to see this transfer of of knowledge in, in different ways. Yeah. So there's Comey and, mm -hmm. and I want you to talk about you have you have two other really cool properties and you're always doing yeah. fun things like you made beer, you have, you know, you're always playing. So I think that's a really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm a very, you know, my background is kind of multifaceted in a way. You know, um, I have a place called Hawker Fair, which is like a, a restaurant that's kind of serving Thai, Isan food or Laotian food. Uh, that, that's kind of my upbringing. Like it's a food that um, I had to learn how to cook myself um, for myself because mom moved away to Thailand. Mom doesn't have recipes besides a handful of this, a pinch of that. Um, so I had to like pretty much reverse engineer a lot of childhood offerings I ate as a kid. And what I noticed 
also like a lot of the dishes aren't served in restaurants that we see um maybe like thai restaurants or is rarely see a lao restaurant to be honest um so i just want to kind of bring that more to the forefront and kind of share that cuisine um, so that's hawk affair uh, and that was more of a personal project that i also wrote a book about as well and the book is really, here. and the book is uh it's it's a it's a, a it's not just a cookbook it's also a biography it talks about my upbringing growing up um, in a Lao community in Oakland um, in 19, from 1981 to high school and trial and tribulations of being a latchkey kid to how I got into cooking and fine dining and how actually Hawk First Cuisine has been shaping the cuisine of Komi, crazy or not, crazy enough. I'm listening and don't think I'm ignoring you. I'm trying to find the book so I can put it up and show everybody. <laughs> I've got too many books in here. Yeah, you got a lot of books in there. Um, so yeah, so then we open a, a more fast casual place, a more fun family oriented place uh, called Hawkingbird. Um, that's kind of based off chicken, like a lot of um, Thai fried chicken, uh, common guy poached chicken and rice, you know, everything's in to-go containers. Like Delicious. Very I've eaten, the thing is, is I feel fortunate enough that I've eaten at all of them. And every time we go, we have a great time. So. And the fact that you use the bile in the tartare at Hawker <laughs> Fair is really rare and actually very difficult yeah. to find. Because you got me on that one, because I could never find it, because I always thought it was a super cool. Yeah, it's, it's a, you get, you get a little Lao, it's, it's, a, it's on the black market and a couple of your Lao grocers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, did I just let something out of the can out of the You gotta know a guy to know a guy that knows a guy. But I think that's what makes food fun, right? When you can get those traditional authentic flavors. And it was new to me. It was very, very distinct. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it does have some medicinal purposes and like interviewing my mom for the book and it's like, why do you do this? It's bitter. And crazy enough, my mom told me I liked it when I was a kid, when I was like six years old. And she was like, yeah, you was eating lop with bio and then we fed it to you and you didn't have no problems with it. And it's like, yeah, maybe I was, a, I was a weird kid. <laughs> oh, no, that's not weird. That's, I mean, it's kids' palates are so, isn't it amazing? Kids' palates, how quickly they change. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. how much they develop. And you, I've learned from watching my son's palate change on what he will eat, what he won't eat, and how it gravitates and changes over time. No, 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 Went no, from no. eating things to not eating things to then re wanting them all over again. It's so yeah, crazy. Exactly. It's like, it's a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like I feel I feel really bad because it's, it's in here. I know I should have a copy of it myself. I don't have it, but um, yeah. So those three, and then um, I partnered with um, Adam Lamoureux, who, who also um, he was the first, pretty much kind of revitalized the Oakland beer scene um, at Linden Street Brewery. We started a brewery together in West Oakland called Old Can, that we just reopened. Actually, we took a little hiatus during a pandemic because we don't package our beer, we only keg our beers and really, there weren't really any restaurants or bars to sell to in 2020. So we just relaunched that um, after uh, two weeks ago, so. Oh, congratulations, because the beer is delicious. For those of you out there who are looking for great beer on draft, I used to serve it at Coxcomb and yeah. loved having it. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's, that's it, you know, and nowadays it's just, yeah, it's just kind of maintaining, trying to get back to, back to the norm and love being a dad. <laughs> you have, see that, you know, I see the great photos and, and, you know. I have a, I have a 10 year old and eight year old. So in 2020, it was actually, I look, you know, trying to make lemonade out of lemons, you know, in 2020. And it's like, it was the most time I ever spent with my kids. You know, I was like domesticated, you know, it's just. It was nice to like actually sit down with them, do homework with them, tuck them in bed, <laughs> not come home when they're already asleep. Um, so yeah, it was very, very rewarding in, in that sense. And yeah, like the girls free, like you said, like just cooking with them too. That was a lot of fun. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is, you know, when you did your book, that was part of uh, Anthony's uh, imprint, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you actually were fortunate enough to go spend time with Tony and travel back. Yeah, we went to Laos um, together. We, we traveled there. 
because he was big into like the whole um you know un dedicated um uh, mine ordinances that was left from the Vietnam War that's also sprinkled around Laos. So we did a show there talking about that and also highlighting some from food that like most of the world haven't seen because Laos is still a communist country and it's very landlocked there. You know, like traveling back there feel like you're back in like the 60s, you know, but the food there is very, very different from your typical Thai food. Um, plays like a lot of flavors like bitterness and herbaceous and uh, things. So we did a show there together. It was, it was, it was, it was a great time. Yeah. If, if, folks, if you have the time, I know it's online. I know you can see it on Netflix or Hulu or whichever one you want to choose to watch it on, but uh, it's a very, very powerful episode. I, um, I've seen it. I've you know, it's, I think it's a really important thing to, for people to take the time and, and, and watch it and, and really get a bigger picture and understanding of not only the food, the culture, but also what, unfortunately, we left behind, which was on a lot of landmines. Right. Yeah. We did a lot more, uh, a lot more than we realized. But though, so let's kind of shift gears here and, and talk about, you know, what you, what your goals are now, where you're, where you're driving towards. Mm. Uh, and, and then we're going to play a little game because you have to work soon, I'm sure. Yeah. I always, um, where, where my head's at now, um, Kumi's back open, you know, we're, we can't be open at full capacity. We're being very, very cautious. We're still doing limited capacity with like social distancing or whatnot, but I'm just happy to see that all the, all my chefs and my staff, it's like in that mindset, like, it's like, hey, you know, we're still a fine dining restaurant given the circumstances. And it was a big learning experience for all of us. That's going to take us a long way. I think what I'm excited about the most is just like we got a chance to, you know, re-energize our batteries, you know, and come out of this looking things at a different angle. Um, it's going to it's gonna better us. I actually now more um, motivated to get back into the fine dining and the artistry of it, like, kind of feel young again, like a young cook again, you know, like still curious, you know, like I, I went, to, went to the Kitchen art, uh, kitchen Arts and Letters uh, website the other day. I'm like, oh my God, I need to catch up on my cookbook buying. <laughs> <laughs> so behind. Um, isn't that, it's an addiction, right? Like this is uh, what you see behind is a small section of the room. It's Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm still, I'm still gonna do my fine dining thing. I still like like that discipline and whatnot, and been having the been having the kids around the restaurant more and more, which has been been fun. And having I had them to get an understanding of what I do on a daily basis. I think like to create that more understanding. It's like, oh, why does Daddy come home at one a.m.? It's like, well, this is what we do. It's the last customer, so and so sits down here, but they won't finish dessert until midnight. Blah blah. So then we gotta clean up. So kind of build that understanding, find that equilibrium or like work-life balance for me a little yeah. bit more. And we, when I did that, we also shifted our hours. We closed Sunday, Mondays now. So now I have a dedicated Sunday for family life and for the rest of the staff as well. So that's some camaraderie that way. They, then if they choose to do things on their day off or you can do farm tours as a group or mm -hmm. do things, it, it, it takes a little bit of burden off everyone. Yeah, exactly. Kind of, let them have loose a little bit and all these guys are happy now to go watch football on Sundays. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, no, I've just been taking it easy. Yeah, I'm just getting back into my, you know, still keeping the uh, my fine dining wheels greased and oiled and kind of do what we do. You know, it's just, uh, I've also been taking care of myself more mentally as well. And, um, you, know, you know, I hit a little bit of mental wall you know, during this pandemic, as like, oh, yeah. you know, it's like this might be a writing my wall. Am I done? <laughs> you know, well, is this a message to me or something? I, I think that's actually a really good point because during the pandemic, and for for those of you who who don't know, it's like there's a lot of us who are always in contact with each other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the Bay Area, we keep tabs on each other, whether we're talking to each other all the time or not. We always know how everybody else is doing. And I think that's really important. James and I are always knowing what's going on with each other. There's Kim, there's Jeremy Fox, who's down in LA. We're always Murad. We're keeping tabs because we all want to make sure 
each other is okay, whether it, they need help at business or they just need help in life. And I think it's been really important that we've all been there for each other when shit's been a little weird. Yeah. For an under, that's an understatement. Shit's been more than a little weird. Yeah. But we've always had each other's backs. And I think that's a really important part of why I love what we do is because, you know, and Ed Lee is a perfect example of somebody like that. Like, you, you know, you can almost feel it when something's gone a little pear shaped with your friends and all of a sudden it's just like, there's that perfect, all of a sudden your phone, your text goes off and you're like, dude, how the fuck did I, I didn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I love that about our industry and how we've always been able to help each other quietly behind closed doors and also in front of open doors too. I think it's just, it's what has been, I think, uh, a heaven sent for, I mean, I know for myself, it's been because it's not been an easy, you know, year and a half. And, and I'm hoping it's been for all this whole group of us to be able to continue to do that moving forward. And I think one of the most important things, like you said, was the fact that we have been able to spend time with our family. I've spent more time with my family than I have in 10 years. That's crazy. Crazy, I know. Right? We think about that. We stop and you take, and then it gives you a bigger perspective. So I think that's been a really good thing for yeah, it's feeling quote unquote normal. I mean, I remember going out like a going to like a grocery store or something like on a Friday or a Saturday. I was like, this is what normal people do. <laughs> exactly. It's been <laughs> it's been a big adjustment, a big learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna play a rapid fire game. Oh. No wrong answers here. I do this with everybody. All right. Yeah. Red or white wine? White. All right. Brown spirits, white spirits? White spirits, gin. <laughs> Granted, I can't drink it anymore, but. <laughs> uh, okay, coffee or tea? Tea. Oh, however, coffee. I'm super sensitive to caffeine. I, it's, coffee is like a recreational thing for me. Really? Yeah, it, it, like, if, like, if I walk in the service and everyone knew I had a cold brew, everyone's scrambling like, oh shit, chef just had a cold brew. He's, he's just like, he's, he's going to be on beast mode right now, running around in circles, <laughs> like pacing, looking at everything, little detail. Yeah. When, when I'm on coffee, it's like, people are like, oh, chef's on coffee. Watch out. So like, it's wow. That's I like a- it. It's fun. I feel like, uh, yeah, I, I go into this like Russell Westbrook mode where I just want to get a triple double that night. <laughs> 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 Stay out of my way. Because I'll work your station, your station, expo, run food. Oh my God. I can see that. Yeah. That's when I have coffee. That's when, that's when I have fun. Usually Saturdays. Saturdays are coffee days. All right. That's, that's coffee days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, uh, hamburger or hot dog? Hamburger. Okay. Ketchup or mustard? Mustard. Dijon or whole grain? Whole grain. Okay. Nigiri sashimi. Nigiri. It's all about the rice. Sea urchin caviar. Sea urchin. Dumplings, ravioli. Dumplings. Wontons. <laughs> Say that specific, right? Uh, noodles, pasta. Same, right? <laughs> but see, yeah, there's the thing. Like, there, people have completely taught, like, some people think noodles are not pasta. Like, there's there's rice noodles, there's, you know, hand-pulled noodles. Yep. Noodles of all genres. Yeah. Beef or pork? Ooh. Now, I went on this vegetarian diet last month, and, and it's been, it was hard the first week. I was like, man, I come home starving, hungry. Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. You know, I say both. Why not both? They both have their great places. Yeah, exactly. For different reasons. Iberico or prosciutto? Uh, I love Spain. Iberico. <laughs> I miss Spain. I'm not due to go back. I haven't been back since 2005. Oh, I want to go so bad. I love, I, I mean, I think everybody wants to travel right now, right? Let's be honest. Uh, yeah. Like, sure. Dark beer, light beer? Light. Beach beers. 4%. Drink like six packs. I call them lawnmower beers. You can drink <laughs> six and still drive the lawnmower in a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I, I, I definitely feel that the refreshing concept of, of uh, 
of beer has been lost because it keeps getting too much. The alcohol level just keeps going through the ceiling. Yeah, and like it's too bitter, like IPAs and like double IPAs. It's like you can't taste anything afterwards. Like your like palate's like blown out. You know, it gets to be too much. Yeah, way too much. Too much. Okay, chocolate or fruit? Fruit, always. Nice. Yeah. Right now, what would be your last? This is, this this will be our last question in here. You get to you get to go to work. Yeah. Um, what is your like your most people never want to answer this honestly. So mm -hmm. what is your favorite junk food? Favorite junk food. Can it be fast food? It could be whatever you want. Yeah. I have this guilty pleasure of eating like church's fried chicken. Church's fried chicken. That's like my thing. Everyone knows it too. My it's birthday. Like it's crazy. Fried chicken is like, it's hard to not love fried chicken. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But predominantly churches, fried chicken. Predominantly <laughs> churches. <laughs> not Popeyes. I had, I had this whole argument about, uh, about with, with Tony. He loves Popeyes. I was like, you been to churches now? Like, no, I've been to churches. Like, dude, it blows Popeyes out of the water. Oh, I no. I've only seen churches in Oakland. And crazy enough, I went to Vancouver. I saw churches in Vancouver. Of all places, Vancouver. Really? Yeah. Well, I got I got somebody here who wants to say hi. Hey, how you doing? Good. How's Hawaii? It was really nice. I, know. I think we're going to Kauai in December. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yeah. he's still on the fence because the kids can't get vaccinated yet. So. Oh yeah. Uh, we haven't canceled yet, so I think she we might do it. <laughs> <laughs> is like they've been so restrictive though that should be fine yeah. our neighbors went there for spring break and it's much, much more quiet it's not so busy wow. over there, so yeah. I'm, I'm dying to get away go somewhere warm exactly, exactly. and not wear shoes for a week <laughs> definitely, definitely <laughs> be good phone. yeah that's the hard part turning off the phone oh god that's always the hard part lose my phone actually lose it <laughs> <laughs> Just leave it here. Fine. Yeah, leave it here. Don't, don't leave your phone. <laughs> You'll have a panic attack. Everybody does when they lose it. It's like losing a limb. It's like, oh, I can't do anything. I can't function. So yeah. for everybody out there, James, if they want to find you, whether it be on social media or the restaurants, best way would be on Instagram to find you at? Yeah, best way on Instagram. The Instagram handle is super simple. My first and last name, no spaces, no periods, nothing. James Sabu at so and once you hit that all my establishments will pop up on there and there's some fun photos there so so folks after this is all said and done there'll be a link at the end so you can click through check out james's restaurants check him out make sure you go and follow him go eat at his restaurants and if you have a restaurant and you can buy his keg beer do so because it is delicious and fun james thank you so much for taking thank time you, chris fun as always pleasure to see you and uh, let's get some coffee. Let's go. I'm actually want to coffee over. on Saturdays. All right, before service. <laughs> All right. Yes, I'll do that. Let's do. I want to come over and see you in service. <laughs> Either that or let's go get some church's chicken. That'll be my first time. So you can take me to a church's. We'll do a church's run. Yeah, they, yeah. I, I got the I got the plug on that. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for your time. Bye, Chris. Talk Cheers. Soon.